All right, well, good evening, everyone. I don't know, good evening is not a popular response of greeting. I apologize for that. It's good to spend some time with you. So excited to be here, um, excited to uh, open up God's Word with you. Um, as was mentioned, uh, I, I have the title, if you will, of Preaching and Teaching, the pastor of Preaching and Teaching at Fellowship, and uh, it's always my joy to open up God's Word and um, to reflect on its, uh, its implications for our lives as Christians. And so I want to begin just by uh, coming to God in prayer, asking Him for just a blessing on our time together. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, it's good to be together tonight. It's good to gather and to worship. It's good to be able to lift up our voices in song to, um, to praise and glorify you and, and to give you thanks uh, for the good news of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is good and kind, who is patient with us, who bears with us, who carries and sustains us. And I pray that tonight in our teaching, we would just have a clearer picture of the wonder of Christ and that our hearts would be changed and transformed as we see uh, the height and the depth and the width of his love for us. And we pray that you would encourage and empower us by your spirit um, to understand the mystery of the gospel that is revealed in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. All right, so um, quick update. Over at Fellowship for the last couple of months, um, I've been teaching uh, on basically the doctrine of salvation. Um, so really dealing with the topic of how does God save sinners. And I've been working through uh, an acronym that's probably known to some of you, an acronym called TULIP. And TULIP, if you're not familiar, stands for Total Depravity, Unconditional Election, Limited Atonement, Irresistible Grace, and the last one, which we're going to focus on tonight, is Perseverance of the Saints. Now, I have it sometimes. Um, I'm excited about theology. Some of my uh, uh, members at Fellowship are not quite as excited as I am about theology. And so they'll kind of look at this and they'll be like, oh, this is, this is just all theological stuff. And that's true. Um, but your theology has all sorts of practical implications. And I think that's especially true of, of this topic tonight. Because tonight we're dealing with a question, can I lose my salvation? And over the years as I pastor, I encounter people who, who actually wrestle tremendously with this question. People who, who actually go through life and they're kind of afraid, they're kind of like, have I been faithful enough? Have I loved Christ enough? In the end, are things going to be okay? And I'm convinced that Christ does not actually want us to live that way. He doesn't want us to go through life with fear and doubt. And one of the passages that makes this really clear is John chapter 10. I want to I start in John chapter 10. Just the context of the passage a minute is... Um, this is the chapter where Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. And, he, and then he basically just walks through how he, how he gathers his sheep, how he calls them and they hear his voice and they follow him. And he basically, he, he leads them home. But in John 10, beginning at verse 22, he has this, this super encouraging um, section where he just, he just reminds us of how loved we are. We'll begin at verse 22. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were gathered around him were there gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the word of the Lord. All right, so... Um, I mentioned that tonight we're definitely going to do some teaching. This is going to be a, um, we're going to walk through a lot of scripture passages. I, I want to actually kind of dive into a bit of theology here. And um, the reason I think this matters is because this topic really shapes our view of who God is. Um, it shapes our view of who we are. And it really, really shapes our view of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And I want to begin by trying to explain what I mean. Um, years ago, I, I can't remember, it was a long time ago, I watched a movie 
Um, and I think it was called Behind Enemy Lines. And basically, kind of the Coles Notes version of this movie um, is it's about this American fighter jet that is shot down behind enemy lines. Hence the title, you see how this works. So th this, this movie, uh, it, it goes on and on, but, but the basic premise is there's this huge uh, rescue operation that's launched by the US Army to come in and to retrieve this pilot. And I wanna share with you just one picture from the final scene, okay? This is the final scene of the movie. And in the final scene, this pilot is surrounded by the enemy, okay? And he is taking fire. There are bullets flying everywhere in classic Hollywood style. No one can hit him. So he's running because he has nowhere to go. So he's running toward the edge of this cliff. He's just sprinting. And, and as he gets closer to the cliff, out of nowhere comes in this U.S. chopper. And dangling from the end of the chopper is this Marine who's got his hand outstretched. And so you have this just suspenseful moment. You know, you just picture this with me. You got the guy and he's running towards the edge of the cliff. And as he gets to the edge of the cliff, he just, he just leaps, you know, Hollywood. Boom, and they catch hands. And they lock there, and they're hanging. And the movie ends with this chopper just, you know, flying off into the distance with these two just holding on to each other for dear life. Now, I kind of laugh about it because it's, a, it's just kind of a ridiculous, it, it's totally unrealistic. But I bring it up for this reason, because I think that's how a lot of people actually think about their salvation. When people think about the gospel, I think a lot of people, they understand the basic premise that we as, as individuals that were born into a broken world, that we are, we're trapped under the power of sin. And they understand the basic premise of the gospel, that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to rescue us. Right? So far, so good. They, they understand that Jesus has come and, and, they, and they envision Jesus as, as kind of reaching out his hand, ready to save us. But then they, they also kind of go, okay, well, that's Jesus' part, but now I have to do my part. I have to make this heroic leap of faith. And not only that, but I need to make sure that I, that I hold on. I need to make sure that I'm strong enough until the day that God brings me home. And the problem with that theology is this, that you, you constantly live with that question, have I been good enough? Have I been faithful enough? Am I going to lose my salvation? Am I going to fall away? So this is the question I want to explore tonight. And one of our confessional statements, um, it's not one we refer to a whole lot, but the Canons of Dort, is a, is a 17th century document, and the entire last chapter is dealing just explicitly with the question of the perseverance of the saints and how this works. And there's, there's a great article. This is Article 8 of the fifth chapter. I just want to read it with you. It says, so it is not through their own merits, and here it's speaking just of believers. It says, so it's not through their own merits or strength, but through the undeserved mercy of God that they neither totally fall away from faith and grace nor remain in their downfall and are finally lost. With respect to themselves, this could not only easily happen, but would undoubtedly happen. But with respect to God, this cannot possibly happen. Since his counsel cannot be changed, his promise cannot fail, the calling according to his purpose cannot be revoked, the merit, intercession, and preservation of Christ cannot be nullified, and the sealing of the Holy Spirit can neither be frustrated nor destroyed. It's an incredibly succinct and accurate explanation of this whole idea of the preservation of the saints. And I love the middle of that answer where it says, if we could lose our salvation, we certainly, certainly would. Thankfully, our, our salvation does not depend on the strength of our faith. It depends on the object of our faith. And that's what I want to drive home in our, in our time together. Let me just offer this definition of the perseverance of the saints the perseverance of the saints teaches that all those who are truly born again will be kept by God's power and will persevere as Christians until the end of their lives. Okay, so that is the doctrine that I want to kind of explore. And I'm going to just walk through three questions together. I'm going to look at the question of what does the Bible say about this topic? Um, what do we do with the whole idea of those who fall away? People that seemed like they genuinely were believers and then walked away from their faith. And then the last question I want to deal with is just quickly, just applying, why, why does it actually 
matter. Okay, so what does the Bible say? Um, I have a bunch of passages on the screen. Um, the writing turned out a little bit small, so hopefully you can, you can see them. I'm not going to go in detail through all these passages, but I want to touch on them uh, briefly. Let me, let me just say this. The overwhelming majority of passages that deal with the whole doctrine of salvation, the overwhelming majority of passages make clear that when God saves uh, someone, when God causes someone to be born again, genuinely brings them to faith, um, God ensures that he absolutely will keep them safe in, in their faith until the end. Right? That, that is the overwhelming majority of passages teach this. So let me just, let me just illustrate using a couple passages. Um, you have a passage like John chapter 3. John chapter 3 is this well-known story where uh, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and uh, he's telling Nicodemus that you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus asks the obvious question. He says, well, how do I enter a second time into my mother's womb? He, and, and Nicodemus is asking the right question. He understands from a physical uh, perspective that when someone is born, you can't really reverse that process. There's, there's no going back. Right? When you're born, you're born. You're, you're there. But I think Jesus is using this to also drive home a spiritual reality. That when someone is born again, when someone is genuinely brought to faith, you, you can't go back. It's kind of like I've used the butterfly analogy, right? You have, a cut, you have a caterpillar and gets wrapped up in this little cocoon thing, and then after a little while, the cocoon breaks open and you got a butterfly. But that butterfly is never going back to being a caterpillar again. And the same is true when it comes to our faith. When, when we are genuinely born again uh, by the power of the Spirit, we are a new creation. We never go back to what we once were. And so that's the, the basic building block that we're working with. And you see that in, in all sorts of passages. So I touched on John chapter 10. Um, let me just highlight these verses from John 10 where Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And then he says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Right, this picture of, of the supremacy of God and of the love of Christ. Now, another passage which is significant, I'll let you kind of study it on your own time, but let me just highlight a couple things from Romans chapter 8. In Romans 8, uh, verse 30, you have um, a passage that is sometimes referred to as the golden chain of salvation. And Romans 8, verse 30 reads as follows. It says, and those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And the whole point there is to say that all of these events they are, they are inherently linked together. The one will inevitably lead to the next. And the picture that's being painted by Paul is that God is ultimately responsible for our salvation from beginning to end. He's ultimately the one who calls. He's the one who justifies. He's the one who glorifies. And if you know this passage, Romans 8, what's really powerful is that it's this conviction of of Paul, the, just the power of God in salvation that leads to his incredible confidence. The very next verse, he says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then he just goes on and he asks all these questions, right? Who can bring any charge against us? Who is to condemn? And then at the end of chapter eight, he's got this powerful section where he talks about how nothing on earth can separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. A couple more passages just briefly here. So uh, you have uh, Ephesians chapter 1. I marked them with little uh, papers because I knew that when I was up here, I wouldn't be able to find them, and that's really awkward as a pastor. So Ephesians chapter 1, you have uh, verse 13 and 14 where we read, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Right? So the Holy Spirit is intended to be, that's like God's seal. Right? It's a guarantee of the inheritance that's in store for us. And that is just affirmed in 1 Peter. It's the same basic teaching. If you know 1 Peter 1, the opening verses are basically about this inheritance that is in store for us, and it's described as imperishable, undefiled, unfading. It's this, this really powerful picture of, of uh, the reward that is in store for those who believe. 
But then verse 5 says, who through faith are shielded by God's power. And I love, I love that bigger picture that as we walk through, through life, that God is actually kind of standing guard over our souls. And so you have other passages I could refer to, but um, the, the gist here is simply to say that the overwhelming majority of these passages um, make it clear that when God brings someone to a saving faith, that he never lets them go. But the question then is, what do we do with those who fall away? And I think this is really, um, it's a pastoral question. It's a personal question. Because we all have people we know who who seem to be believers at one point. They, they seem to be committed followers of Christ, and then somewhere along the way, they, they abandoned their faith. They, they walked away. What do we make of that? And what do we do when we see things like, um, like sometimes you have situations where there's like pastors who the term they use now is that they deconstruct. Right? They walk away from their faith. I, I remember growing up, there was this book that was kind of all the rage um, it was a book by Joshua Harris. It was called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. How many of you read that book? Be honest with me. Come, liars. <laughs> I knew, I'm not the only one who read that book. But Joshua Harris was this guy. He was, he was, you know, he was like this star. You know, this pastor of a large church, super influential. And then, you know, over the last number of years, he deconstructed, walked away from his marriage, walked away from his faith, no longer no longer sees himself as a Christian. You go, how does that work? And I think the real challenge is, what do we do with certain Bible passages um, which seem to suggest that this is actually possible? And in particular, I want to spend just a, a few minutes in the book of Hebrews because the, the book of Hebrews, probably more than any other book of the New Testament, uses this language of those who, who fall away. Um, let, let me just, I'll, I'll be, just there's three passages I want to touch on, but Hebrews 3, just as a, as a reference point, Hebrews 3 verse 12 says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. Again, if you listen to that, it kind of sounds like, okay, you got to make sure that you're strong enough. Hebrews uh, 6, and this is a passage I want to spend just a little bit of time on. Um, Hebrews 6, beginning at verse 4, says, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance, and you kind of go, okay, that, for many people, I think those are, those are terrifying verses, and they wonder, what if, what if in the end that's me? So I think we need to, one of the things we need to do when we look at this passage is we need to ask the question, who is the author of Hebrews speaking to? Right, he talks about those who've been enlightened, who've tasted kind of the goodness of uh, of God, who've, who've experienced something of the Holy Spirit. So who is it that he has in mind? If he's referring to genuine believers, then you cannot hold to the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. If he's describing genuine believers here who have fallen away, then we obviously we just can't hold to that doctrine. It doesn't, it doesn't work. But I think if you look at the broader context of chapter 6, it makes clear that he, doesn't, he does not have genuine believers in Christ here in mind. Let, let me just offer, this is why I think just, if I can encourage you in something, just the careful exposition of Scripture, the careful study of Scripture is so important in understanding these things. So if you look at Hebrews chapter 6 and you go on past our passage to verse 7, um, in verse 7 and 8, the analogy is used of land that drinks up the rain. And basically, there are two different types of, of land that are presented. One, which drinks up the land. So the land, you might say the gospel falls on both. One land brings up fruit. The other land, in contrast, produces nothing but thorns and, and thistles. It, it's, 
it's kind of worthless land. It just does not respond to the rain. And then if you look at verse 9, the, the author of Hebrews makes this contrast. He says, even though we speak like this, dear friends, right? So even though we're speaking these, these hard things to you in the previous section, he says, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. And so he's making a a comparison here, basically between people who've been part of the church community, who've who've been enlightened in some sense, they understand the gospel, they've been in the realm of the Holy Spirit, they've been in the place where the Holy Spirit works, they've tasted something of the goodness of God, but in the end, they have not actually embraced the message of Christ. They fall away, and I would say largely they fall away from the community itself. And if you look at the book of Hebrews as a whole, that is is one of the major concerns that the author has. And we need to keep that in mind when we think about these passages. The author of Hebrews is constantly contrasting the Israelites in the Old Testament with the church, the New Covenant community in the New Testament. And he's he's pointing back and saying, hey, don't make the same mistakes that that they did. And one of the main mistakes that they made was that they were often satisfied to just be part of the community. Right? The Israelites were often chastised because they were like, well, we're part of the people of God. We're fine. We're good. And the author of Hebrews says, it's not enough just to belong to the community. You must belong to Christ. Right? This is kind of like the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, which Jesus tells when he talks about the seed that falls on the path or the seed that falls in the rocks or the seed that gets choked out by the weeds but there's some seed that falls on the good soil and that produces fruit. Well, how do you tell one from the other? Well, you tell it over time. And you tell it kind of through hardship, through trials, through those seasons where the sun is beating down. That's where you tell the difference between the, 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 the seed that's genuinely rooted in Christ and the seed that's not. And I think that's why you hear the New Testament authors sometimes use this language um, where they encourage people to continue to persevere. They're they're not asking them to demonstrate the strength of their faith. What they're doing is they're they're asking them to demonstrate that they have the right object of their faith, that that their faith is rooted in Christ. Let me try and maybe explain um, using an image. I I began by sharing this this picture. Um, If we can pull that one back up again. I began by sharing this picture of this, this helicopter, right? And I said, well, this is how a lot of people imagine uh, salvation to work, right? They, they have this kind of picture that they need to make this heroic leap of faith and they need to really be strong enough to hold on to Jesus so that in the end they don't end up falling away. But I would suggest to you that we need to have a different picture in mind. Maybe we can pull up this next one. I think, I think this is a stronger image for us to have in mind. Let me explain. This is a, a rescue helicopter. So I want you to think about this. You're, you're in the mountains somewhere. Um, okay, it's a little hard to imagine. We don't have those. But you are, you're somewhere, okay? And you're injured. You're, you're badly injured, and you're in need of help. So on the scene arrives said rescue helicopter, and rescuer gets dropped down by the rope. Now imagine that the rescuer gets kind of close to you, and he's hovering just above you, and he reaches out his hand, and he says, hey, just... Grab onto my hand. Hold on tight. The hospital is just four miles that way. That would be ridiculous. They would never do that because they they would obviously know that you, you don't have the strength to hold on. What they ask you to do in these situations is, is they ask you to trust them. And then they wrap a harness around you and they literally, they, they bind you to themselves and then they airlift you out. And I would say that's how we have to understand the gospel. The gospel is about Jesus coming to you and and asking you to trust him. Not to be strong enough, not to be good enough, not to be faithful enough. He's just asking you to trust him. And then he wraps his arms around you and he binds you to himself. And he holds you, not just for the moment, but he holds you for eternity. And I think it's so important that we have this theology correct. Let me, just, let me just conclude with a quick slide here on why this matters. The reason I think this matters so much is because your theology of salvation is going to have a huge, huge impact on your experience of the Christian life. If, if you think that the, 
that your salvation is ultimately partially kind of dependent on you, if you are going to constantly be focused on the strength of your faith. Constantly aware of your flaws, your failures, your weaknesses. And you're going to be living with, with fear and anxieties and worry and doubts. But if you are convinced that your salvation is completely dependent on Christ and his finished work, if you're completely focused on the object of your faith, then you're going to be able to enjoy a life of joy and comfort and confidence and hope. And I, I genuinely believe that that's the way that Christ wants us to live. I, mean, I think that's why we, we have this beautiful passage in Hebrews 12, you know, where we're encouraged to run with perseverance the race set before us, casting off sin that so easily entangles. But then it says, and fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And I want to encourage us uh, to do that in our own walk with the Lord as well. Let me, let me end it there. I'll just offer a prayer, and then I'll, I'll take some questions. Gracious God, thank you for um, just the wonder of your word. Thank you for um, just your love in Jesus Christ. So often in our, in our life, um, we are tempted to be discouraged because we see so many flaws and weaknesses and shortcomings uh, in our faith. And we need to be encouraged to keep our eyes on you. To remember that in Christ, uh, there are no flaws, there are no weaknesses, there are no failures. And we are loved and held and safe and secure, and not because of who we are, but because of who he is, because we are bound to him through faith. And so we give you the praise, we give you the glory for the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray.